Welcome everyone, good afternoon, and thank you so much for joining us uh, today for the International Institute's Arts of Devotion Conference. Uh, my name is Reginald Jackson, and I'm currently director of the Center for Japanese Studies here at the University of Michigan Ann Arbor. And I'm also associate professor of pre-modern Japanese literature and performance in the Department of Asian Languages and Cultures. Um, so today I have the distinct honor and pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker, Professor Duncan Ryuken Williams. Um, and I'd like to start by saying that, you know, when I was initially contacted, uh, invited to suggest speakers for this conference, the very first person uh, who came to mind was Professor Williams. Uh, insofar as the conference sought to connect traditional and contemporary contexts, uh, consider a multifaceted and multicultural notion of the concepts of art and devotion, and to reach beyond the ivory tower and engaging a broader audience, I could think of no better uh, thinker and global citizen to share their work. So Professor Williams is currently Professor of Religion in East Asian Languages and Cultures and the director of the USC uh, Shinso Ito Center for Japanese Religions and Culture um, and former chair of the uh, University of Southern California's School of Religion. He's previously held the Shinjo Ito's Distinguished Chair of Japanese Buddhism at UC Berkeley and also served as director of Berkeley's Center for Japanese Studies for four years as well. He has also been ordained since 1993 as a Buddhist priest in the Soto Zen tradition and served as the Buddhist chaplain at Harvard University from 1994 to 1996. Professor Williams is the author of numerous um, uh, books and articles, uh, which include The Other Side of Zen, a Social History of Soto Zen Buddhism and Tokugawa Japan on Princeton University Press from 2005, and also the editor of seven volumes, uh, including Hapa Japan, uh, Issei Buddhism in the Americas, American Buddhism, and Buddhism and Ecology from 1997. He's also translated numerous works from Japanese into English, including Putism, Putting Buddhism to Work, A New Theory of Economics and Business Management. His latest book, which I'm very excited about and enjoyed very much uh, and recommend to you all, is called American Sutra, a story of faith and freedom in the Second World War on Harvard University Press from uh, 2019. This book has earned the number three spot on the LA Times bestseller list for nonfiction. And in 2011, Professor Williams received a commendation from the Japanese government for deepening the mutual understanding between the peoples of Japan and California. So needless to say, time doesn't permit me to enumerate all of Professor Williams' many achievements. However, let me just add in closing that besides being a world-renowned, award-winning scholar, Professor Duncan Duke and Williams both preaches and practices a form of socially engaged Buddhism that avoids the style of disaffected and disconnected scholarly inquiry that tends to dominate the academy. In addition to writing enlightening articles and books on religion, his contributions to mixed race studies within the Japanese diaspora have opened fertile intellectual spaces for minority scholars in the academy as well. Moreover, he extends his scholarly and moral commitments to causes outside the classroom. And these include the recent Turu for Solidarity movement, which is called um, for Buddhist leaders to protest the inhumane treatment of migrant children. That Professor Williams links past injustices like those that he'll describe today in terms of Japanese concentration camps during World War II um, to present problems through an ethically driven devotional practice is nothing short of inspiring. I for one believe that we are truly blessed to have him in the academy and to have him here with us today to hopefully enlighten us just a little bit. So with that, please join me in welcoming Professor Duncan Yukin Williams. Um, and just as a note, uh, before Professor Williams gives his presentation, we'd like to share a brief video presentation from the University of Michigan uh, Museum of Art uh, on a series in their collection that's related to the topic of his talk today. Thank you so much. Hi everyone, my name is Jennifer Fries. I am the Associate Curator of Photography at the University of Michigan Museum of Art. Thank you so much for having me and my colleagues here to talk to you about some of the works from our collection. When I learned of the of Dr. Williams's uh, keynote topic, I immediately knew which series I wanted to share with you. So I'm gonna dive right in. This is a series by contemporary, now late photographer, Patrick Nagatani, called the Ryoichi Excavations. Nagatani himself was born in 1945 to two parents that were in Japanese Americans interned in separate camps during World War II. 
um, the series itself is based on an experience that Nagatani had visiting one of the camps in California. When he visited, he found in the dust, in the dirt, a flattened toy car. And from that experience emerged this entire series titled The Ryoichi Excavations. Um, what I'm gonna show you are a few images from the series, which is big and elaborate, constructs an entire um, contrived series of histories and events that never actually occurred, but are so variously represented by the photographer through his images that you might actually leave our conversation today thinking that they did in fact occur. So Nagatani is staging this series of photographs of excavations performed allegedly by an archaeologist named uh, Ryoichi Yo Yoshimura. Um, and we see that archaeologist, we see Ryoichi pictured here in these ID type photographs. So even from the start, Ryo, uh, Nagatani is using photography to kind of verify his story. However, Ryoichi uh, looks surprisingly like Nagatani. Um, and we see the journal of Ryoichi on the right, uh, the canteen, everything here kind of tries to verify the story that's being told. And as the story goes, Ryoichi actually approached Nagatani, allegedly, to photograph 15 years worth of archaeological efforts on behalf of Ryoichi and his team. Ryoichi received a series of maps uh, that point to locations ac across the globe where a civiliz an ancient civilization allegedly buried luxury automobiles um, at different sites. And so over the course of 1985 to about 2000, uh, Ryoichi and his team document, as you can see here in journals and maps um, through artifacts that they found, um, like the cuneiform tablet or the etch-a-sketch um, pictured here. Everything is thoroughly documented and um, conveniently all that exists of the evidence of these archaeological expeditions are Nagatani's photographs. So what you see here are locations throughout the world where Ryoichi and his team have unearthed these automobiles. And for example, here in North America, this particular site has been unearthed near the very large array, the VLA in New Mexico. Um, and so Nagatani is playing with our own perceptions of technology and history, kind of reconstructing and remining them um, for the contemporary viewer. In case it wasn't obvious already, Nagatani has completely from top to bottom staged these photographs for the viewer. Everything is made on this micro scale in a very convincing tableau using kind of film set strategies, camera tricks, all before Photoshop, in fact. Um, so if you don't remember a mummified Porsche being unearthed in Egypt, um, perhaps this is why. Stonehenge, we find a partially buried Bentley. In China, we find at a necropolis, these Volkswagen Beetles that had been staged, buried. They almost look like the bodies of statues that, that are being unearthed. You can see every little detail of the photograph has been meticulously staged by the photographer. Those tiny little shovels, the stairs, like the ladders, um, you know, everything is kind of set just so it looks as if the archaeologists and the team had just left things to be photographed um, in situ. So in summary, this is a very brief overview of a very elaborate project, but I just wanted to share with you how Nagatani himself um, explains this particular series. He says, quote, my photographs of Ryoichi's excavations present a temporal paradox, evidence of an automobile culture which seems to parallel that of our own 20th century, but found in widely disparate times and places. 
So kind of in conclusion, Nagatani's images look so realistic, so veristic, and yet the narrative doesn't align with our own perceptions of history, which of course are also constructed. Um, so Nagatani is really inviting us, the viewer, to understand and consider photography's role uh, in shaping memory and shaping history and um, the precarious relationship between photography and truth. Thank you all so much and take care. Okay, um, I hope it's, um, you can hear me okay. And uh, first of all, I just wanna thank uh, Professor Reginald Jackson from the Center for Japanese Studies uh, for such a kind introduction. And, uh, and of course, all of the other uh, units uh, that comprise the International Institute for uh, uh, inviting me to join you today. Uh, this is really, uh, despite what Professor Jackson said, not a, necessarily an area I'm, uh, uh, you know, have expertise in, but I hope uh, to share with you a little bit about um, the book that uh, Professor Jackson mentioned, uh, American Sutra, uh, about Buddhism and the World War II Japanese American incarceration, and then link it to uh, this project that I've also been working on uh, uh, to develop and create a new monument. Um, uh, to uh, remember uh, the names of all of those who experienced uh, incarceration and family separation, unjust deportation uh, back in World War II. So um, I'm gonna try to share my screen and um, use some uh, slides to, to help uh, do this talk. Uh, so uh, I think most, uh, Everyone, uh, you know, may know that there was uh, the confinement of, of roughly 125,000 persons of Japanese ancestry. Uh, if we include Japanese uh, Latin Americans and and uh, U.S. citizens and Japanese nationals, uh, the number is roughly 125,000 people. And uh, uh, I've been working on this project to to actually get a very precise number of people and all of their names into a, a comprehensive document and uh, uh, create a monument uh, uh, to honor all of these names. And so that's where I'm going to go. Uh, but first, I, I wanted to just mention a few things about uh, this book uh, that I wrote and, 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 and how it plays into uh, where religion and uh, devotion and uh, art making and so forth may intersect a little bit. So my entrance into the study of uh, the World War II Japanese American incarceration and issues around uh, race and religion and American belonging uh, is not based on my own academic training as a scholar of Japan and, 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 and Buddhist studies, but it came from uh, when about 20 some years ago at this point, uh, I was finishing my dissertation and uh, my advisor, I had several advisors at, at my university at that time. And one of them was uh, Masatoshi Nagatomi, uh, very well known a scholar of Jap Japanese, well, not just Japanese, uh, I should say Buddhist studies in general. And I was, I was uh, he, he passed away suddenly uh, and uh, after I finished my dissertation and I was still around and I try to help the family take care of some of the affairs of cleaning up his office. And uh, I was also a Buddhist priest. So, you know, uh, officiating the memorial service. And as I was doing some of these things, I discovered in his documents in between like dissertation chapters, uh, these yellowed pages, um, which wasn't his handwriting in Japanese. I, I kind of knew what it looked like, and but it had the name Nagatomi on it. And I would come to learn it was his father's diaries from uh, back in World War II in a camp called Manzanar. And to be honest, uh, you know, I grew up in Japan until I was 17 years old, and I had no family, you know, connection to the Japanese American uh, uh, incarceration experience from World War II, and so. I was so ignorant about 
this history. And so as I was trying to help the family, they wanted, you know, once I discovered this diary, they asked me to translate it and as a way to honor my teacher and uh, that, that family, I, I did so. And I would come across words like misuhoru, like mess hall and you know, all these, I had to figure out what they all meant. I, I spent, I think, the next 10 years trying to study every book and article and dissertation ever written on uh, the World War II internment and incarceration. And uh, uh, over time, I translated many Buddhist priest diaries and uh, uh, correspondence from Japanese into English. And, and that became the basis of this book that I wrote. And along the way, I would come to discover that uh, we tend to think about what happened during World War II in terms of race. But in fact, uh, many people uh, uh, were targeted even prior to the war uh, for arrest and uh, a kind of selected or targeted uh, internment uh, that had not just to do with race, but to do with religion. And uh, for example, in this image, you see uh, Reverend Asaida from the Liliha Shingonji Temple in Honolulu uh, being arrested. And uh, even before uh, the smoke had cleared at Pearl Harbor, the FBI had uh, uh, sent out teams to arrest people. And the very first person to be arrested, uh, even before, 30 minutes before martial law was declared uh, on December 7th, 1941, uh, the very first, first person arrested was Bishop Gikyo uh, Kuchiba uh, of the Hompa Honganji Buddhist uh, Temple. And so I wondered, you know, why was it that Buddhist priests, like, wouldn't they go after consular officials or other people suspected of being a threat to national security or something in a time of war? Uh, the second person arrested was somebody in my sect of Buddhism from Taiheji Temple and also in Honolulu. So I was like, why are they so fixated on arresting Buddhist priests? And I would come to learn about the decades of surveillance and uh, of temples and the making of registries by the Office of Naval Intelligence, the Army G2 and the FBI uh, that uh, had to do with this understanding that Buddhists represented uh, a group of people who were, uh, if not un-American in terms of an identity that was based on a very narrow concept of a white Christian America kind of concept. but if not just un-American, like anti-American, like a threat to national security. And so uh, one of the things I talk about in the book is, 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 is this targeting of Buddhism and, and, that, and how it has um, uh, uh, a much longer history than uh, some kind of like war hysteria that happened after uh, Pearl Harbor, but this is a very planned process to target uh, a particular group of people based on not only race, but religion. And so, for example, in this arrest warrant and so forth of uh, another Buddhist priest on the Hawaiian Islands, uh, uh, Reverend Miyamoto, you can see he's been placed in what's called Group A. The FBI had these kind of different tiered and registries of people that they had made. And people who were in this Group A were those considered to be the most dangerous and those who should be interned in case of war uh, with Japan. And so those lists have been made uh, well prior to the Pearl Harbor attack and, and uh, Buddhist priests and Shinto priests, but not Christian ministers were uh, considered as uh, particularly dangerous uh, community leaders. And this I would come to discover has in fact a much longer history. Um, Professor Jackson talk, uh, talk, talked about Sudu for Solidarity. I've been involved in uh, a group that focused on racial justice and immigration rights and so forth uh, from a Japanese American community. And uh, we've been trying to uh, raise awareness about what has been happening at the border in the last several years uh, with family separation and uh, uh, ch uh, child detention. And um, of course, the language about a group of people that's uh, kind of like these migrant caravans invading the nation and so on. This has a very long precedent. Uh, uh, talk about building a Chinese wall, symbolically, of course, on the Pacific or an invasion uh, come uh, in the years prior to 
uh, and around the time of the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. And the language that's often used uh, are about these heathen chini. That's the kind of slur word that they use to indicate a racially unassimilable and religiously unacceptable uh, group of people in terms of belonging uh, in America. And this idea of the yellow peril, a kind of group overwhelming uh, a, a, a land. Um, in this case, you can see the Harper's Weekly thing with the you know, Christian cross kind of illuminating a land and this kind of ominous black clouds with the Buddha in it kind of uh, approaching uh, as a kind of threat. Um, and you can see that kind of thing replicated uh, during World War II. Uh, for example, in the other image you see here of a samurai with, you know, on a militarized uh, a tank uh, with the uh, Buddha as the kind of like the front face of it. That kind of uh, conflation of race and religion uh, is something that uh, uh, not that many studies on the World War II incarceration kind of uh, uh, pointed out. And so uh, just to very quickly uh, run through what I, what I think are the important points about the incarceration experience is that uh, uh, after that selective targeting of people that where religion mattered, uh, of course, ultimately on the West Coast, at least, uh, there was it's in essence, a, what we might call an ethnic cleansing of the West Coast of all persons of Japanese uh, ancestry. Um, as somebody who mixed race myself, I was wondering about what about people who were like half or a fourth or, you know, some not 100% not Japanese. And I would come to learn about uh, an orphanage uh, where I am in Los Angeles, where one of the chief architects of the incarceration, Colonel Carl Bendenston was asked by the orphanage director, we have a lot of these mixed race babies and kids here. I guess, you know, at that time, California had an anti-miscegenation law that didn't allow interracial marriage. And so a lot of kids were, uh, placed in orphanages. And so his reply to that about these uh, mixed, mixed race uh, children were that uh, he said, if they have a single drop of Japanese blood in them, I want them in camp. And so that kind of reference to one drop. And so it's, it, 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 you know, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, movement of p persons of Japanese ancestry from the West Coast of the United States was uh, really, um, uh, you know, 99.9% uh, uh, conducted. And it didn't matter if you were a small child, a baby, mixed race baby, if you were an infirm grandmother, if you were a US citizen or not, uh, you were ending up uh, in one of these camps, you know, for a time indefinite, a place unknown, um, and you're told you have a week to 10 days to uh, look in your apartment or house and figure out what you're going to take. You're told you can take what you can carry. Uh, and people would end up at places like this. It's just the Puyallup Assembly Center. It's kind of euphemistic terminology uh, uh, where, 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 where people were placed until the larger war relocation authority, the WRA camps, these more permanent war duration camps were being built. They were sent to horse stables and racetracks and county, you know, fairgrounds and livestock uh, centers and so forth. Um, and you would take that suitcase with you. Uh, you don't know where you're going exactly how, for how long. And uh, uh, you try to make your life uh, somewhat dignified or decent in that kind of situation of a great disruption uh, and dislocation. Um, in this case, uh, this is in Portland, it's still there, North Portland, um, it's the um, International Livestock and Expo Center. Uh, but back in World War II, it's converted into one of these assembly centers for people in Portland, Oregon. Um, this is a photo um, of one of the uh, uh, inner barracks uh, at this at this uh, uh, assembly center where Reverend Tansai Terakawa's uh, daughter uh, Hiroko is playing checkers with her friend uh, Lillian Hayashi, and you can see that they made uh, it as uh, you know livable as possible with what they could bring. 
And uh, amongst the things that they were told uh, when you entered these places, they were really uh, kind of like prisons in the sense that uh, they called it contraband, but they would search your suitcase to see what you had that was unacceptable. So guns, of course, were unacceptable. Cameras were unacceptable. Uh, so you could get a guard to take a photo or something like that. But uh, you, you couldn't have certain kind of items. And among the things that they banned were Japanese language books. Uh, and so if you had a, uh, a sutra or a, a book of haiku or something like that, those were confiscated as contraband. And the two exemptions were you could have a Christian Bible in Japanese and an English Japanese language dictionary. So the message that people were getting as they entered these uh, 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 confinement sites were that to be American, to be a loyal American was to adhere to some kind of notion of, let's call it like Anglo-Protestant normativity, like Anglo both in the sense of whiteness, but also in the sense of English only, and, and this kind of idea of being a Christian uh, was acceptable. Uh, but this family obviously didn't listen to that message because you can see they have a photo of the Buddha and an American flag. And they were, I think, claiming uh, that you could be both Buddhist and American at the same time. So that's the type of general flow of the book. So I'm gonna switch now to the monument and what I'm trying to do to remember this kind of history about exclusion based on race and religion. Um, amongst the things I would read in uh, that diary I mentioned at the top, uh, Reverend Nagatomi would talk about how he had to, you know, perform so many funerals and memorial services that first winter into spring uh, in, of 42, 43, because the tar paper barracks were built very hastily, uh, a lot of holes, it's so hot during the day in these desert locations, uh, so cold at night. Uh, the vulnerable, the babies, elderly people uh, were dying at, at uh, quite a high rate. And so if you can imagine, there's already the kind of loss of home, loss of jobs, loss of businesses, loss of, you know, if you're a college student, education, and then you lose a family member. So it's, those are the circumstances that people began to put a special interest in religious and devotional um, uh, ways of remembrance, ways not to let this situation that the government put you in uh, be something that uh, would take away the humanity of each person, even if they were a small baby. Um, when it, uh, oops, sorry. When it came to Reverend Nagatomi, uh, he was, as I mentioned, in Manzanar in California, you know, eastern part of California, uh, in the desert there. And he uh, ultimately ends up building uh, what is still there. Uh, uh, you can still go to Manzanar and you see, see it there. It's, just, it's, it's called the Ireto, you know, literally consoling spirits tower. Uh, but he built it, um, you can see his sketch there, uh, as a kind of five-tiered, like, Gorinto, you know, five-tiered uh, stupa, uh, you know, traditionally supposed to house the bones of the Buddha. It's supposed to be this kind of remembrance of the Buddha and the five tiers are representing the five kind of parts of the Buddha's body and so forth. And the relics are held there. But so they built this thing out of concrete in the middle of the desert at the cemetery site uh, in time for 1943 Obon. Uh, which is the Japanese Buddhist ancestral uh, festival where they welcome back uh, the dead uh, in addition to ancestors, the recently departed. Uh, it's called Nibon, the first Obon after somebody dies. Reverend Nagatomi really wanted to build it by uh, August of 43 so that uh, uh, they would have this. And he, he went around barrack to barrack asking family members to pitch in five cents or 10 cents to buy the concrete and the YBA, the Young Buddhist Association of San Pedro, they were like the fishermen, Terminal Island uh, area, LA fishermen, they, they did the manual labor to build this thing. And he would write again and again at night, these three characters, I, De, To. Uh, to, you know, is tower and E means to console, 
uh, there is the spirit like he and he wrote it again he knew like once he wrote it the calligraphy and it's in concrete you can't change it so he really practiced that and and he he accomplished what he wanted to do and that monument is still still there and it's his way of not forgetting those who who passed away and uh, letting the government kind of uh, ignore all of these deaths uh, that happened in camp. Um, I sometimes uh, think about how in that period, you know, these are some of these photos are actually iconic photos of Japanese Americans as they're about to go into camp and they were just reduced to a number. And uh, you see on the right, uh, this, uh, those, you know, they called them bango, which just, you know, in Japanese just means number, but uh, back in the Hawaii, in the plantation, uh, uh, sugar plantations, they couldn't pronounce Yokoyama or uh, uh, Yamashita or whatever. So they just gave them numbers. And uh, I think this is longer uh, history in America. I think Isabel Wilkerson's cast, uh, I think makes this really uh, uh, insightful argument about dehumanization, how that works and uh, uh, in terms of chattel slavery and, and, and the cotton plantations and how num you know, you're just a number. But this, this idea of being reduced to number, uh, being placed en masse into these camps because the government can't figure out how to treat people as individuals. The United States at that time was also at war with Germany, you know, Nazi Germany, fascist Italy, as well as militarized, uh, you know, Japanese imperial government. But there was no mass incarceration of all German Americans, all Italian Americans, uh, but rather is a selective targeting of a few people uh, that they put in the Department of Justice camps. And so this idea that there's this kind of like group of people that are this mysterious oriental undifferentiated group, uh, uh, this was uh, something that uh, was at the, at the, at the heart of, of how and why uh, this happened to the Japanese American community. And so I'm trying now to retrieve that give back some uh, uh, the names to people. Uh, and it, unfortunately, it's never been done before. Nobody has gone through all of the camp records uh, from the WRA camps, from um, you know, I, the, the uh, Museum of Art person from University of Michigan talked about uh, Patrick Nagatami, uh, Nagatani uh, and his artwork. Uh, and uh, so I looked up you know, uh, his, uh, the, his dad and mom, uh, they, they, they uh, were in two different camps. They exited right before the war to Chicago because they were able to get a job sponsor there. And uh, they met there and uh, that artist, was, Nagatani, Nagatani was born in Chicago in uh, August of 1945. But these are the type of uh, uh, lists that I'm trying to go through one by line by line by line and, and to create this uh, uh, holistic list. Uh, we also have to look at uh, you know, internally created lists for the people that were in the Department of Justice camps, uh, like Lordsburg, New Mexico, and and uh, just going again line by line to make sure we are not leaving anybody out. But that's the kind of big project that I have right now, um, a project to uh, to compile for the first time uh, this list of names of all persons of Japanese ancestry who experienced incarceration back in World War II. Um, this is something that uh, those who were involved in the making of uh, the National Memorial for Peace and Justice, uh, I think more colloquially well known, you know, in Alabama as the lynching memorial, the scholars that were behind that project, they initially had to do the painstaking work of every county in the American you know, like making sure nobody's left out, uh, uh, the names of those who experienced that kind of racialized uh, uh, violence and exclusion, and um, uh, and and and, uh, and honoring those persons' names uh, uh, in a monument uh, 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 is such an important one in 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 Alabama. But um, I've been trying to think through what 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 um, what what approach to take for the, uh, a names monument. And I've been looking not only at the lynching memorial, but the 9-11 memorial, and of course, uh, the Maya Lin design for um, the Vietnam War Memorial, and trying to figure out how to not only 
properly render the names and display the names. Uh, Myelin took, the, took an approach that made it difficult. It's not in alphabetical order, it's by date of combat death. And so her idea was that people would need to spend time not only looking for particular names, but uh, in the search of it, interact with the monument. And so um, I've been trying to think through what's a kind of like a Buddhist way, what's a way that uh, I could also honor Reverend Nagatomi and what he did with the Mansana uh, what Ireto. Are, what are some ways that are in the kind of Japanese and Japanese American and Buddhist traditions um, for creating monuments? And so one idea uh, is I'm hoping to create this names list in three different formats. And one is in the idea of kind of a book as a monument. Uh, this is uh, instead of date of death, uh, which would be the normal way, like as a Buddhist priest, like, you know, when we have a memorial service, we would chant a different sutras and then dedication verse called echo, and then we recite the names. And then Shotsuki Hoyo or like monthly memorial service, we would take out this book of the past, the Kakocho, and we have the names uh, uh, kind of sequenced by date of death. But because in the case of World War II Japanese Americans, there are still some 90 year olds and you know late 80 year olds who were youngsters and, and uh, so forth in, in camp that are still alive. We can't obviously honor them in that kind of manner of date of death, but uh, I'm doing it by date of birth and, and kind of ordering and sequencing the eldest person that went into camp uh, in 1940, uh, one December was, was 90 some year old. And then in 1945, six as the camps were closing, uh, babies born are the last names on this list. But it's a kind of way of a Buddhist, I think, way of, of, of honoring names that uh, makes it like my lens project a little bit harder to find, but uh, uh, a way to, 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 to call out uh, these names uh, in a certain way. And uh, creating a website version of this names list where uh, one could look up the name, tap on it, find out what uh, their birth year was, uh, what camps they were in, something that you can't do in a physical book. And finally, uh, some, uh, a, a, an actual physical installation. And that's where I'd like to end today uh, uh, to talk about that. And I'm inspired by uh, people like the Nishura brothers who are in Heart Mountain Camp, Wyoming, who use found wood, you know, in the desert wood. They would take, uh, back, back then the fruit and vegetables were at the mess halls were in these wooden crates. They would take the wood off of that and they were master carpenters and they crafted uh, uh, butsudan, shumidan, these kind of Buddhist altars. Uh, they would, uh, others would uh, take the peach, pit, you know, in some camps, they had a ration of one piece of fruit per week. And so they would keep the peach pits to make um, uh, uh, a kind of prayer, you know, ojizu or prayer bead. So kind of using what you could find to, 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 to make something uh, to, per, to be able to persist and survive and maintain something. Um, and uh, going back to Patrick uh, Nagatani, he did his own kind of photography work um, uh, at the different camps. Uh, and these are the ones his two parents were uh, in. Uh, and so uh, one is the famous, the one on the right is the famous one at Manzanar, the one that Reverend Nagatomi helped build. And the other is the one in Rower in Arkansas. Uh, Reverend Daitits Hayashima, another Buddhist priest, uh, helped to build that one. And since it's, it's also, if you look at the base of it, it's hard to see here, but uh, there's a, a lotus flower uh, or leaves, I should say. And it's in the, again, the traditional five tiered uh, elements uh, of the Gorinto are there. And in that case, they used to give that monument structural integrity. The, they had found barbed wire, uh, the steel kind of like a rebar and use that to build this monument. And it comes from a teaching that people like uh, uh, Reverend uh, Yogan Senzaki used to uh, con con continuously preach in camp, uh, which was that you need to draw on uh, what he called the, the muddy waters to let the lotus flower grow. And to show that example, uh, my, one of my friends, 
upon reading my book, he, he, he drew this, uh, he, he's actually the abbot of Zenshuji Temple, historic Japanese American temple in Little Tokyo here in Los Angeles. But he drew this painting in which uh, the metaphor of the lotus flower, the, the power of uh, awakening and, and, and liberation uh, is supposed to be, you know, growing up out of this muddy world, the Saha world, the kind of dusty world, the world of suffering. And you can see in this kind of pond here, it kind of looks like America, but this it's growing up beyond the, beyond the barbed wire. Uh, but, but people like Senzaki and other Buddhist priests would preach that, you know, you can't grow lotus flowers in pure or sterile water. You need to grow it. It actually needs the mud, the nutrients from it to grow up. And so that's how I've been thinking also about this monument. And, and uh, uh, so in terms of, of material and shape, I've been thinking again to honor Reverend Hayashima and Rower and Reverend uh, Nagatomi in Manzanar to make a monument that has that five tier look, but in a kind of more contemporary way. Uh, and then uh, use, uh, you know, soil, clay, like ceramic uh, uh, has been my thinking, uh, but, but made from uh, having some soil from each of the camps be used to make the material to, to ultimately uh, uh, at, at the kiln kind of create a monument that have these five, five uh, tiers of a, of a traditional uh, Buddhist uh, memorial monument of a Gorinto, but uh, to do it in such a way that we uh, light project the names uh, of all 125,000 people uh, on uh, a monument that uh, is in part at least made of ceramic. And that uh, the idea was not only to, to draw on the soil of each place, but also to uh, pre-break the monument uh, and adorn it uh, with, with gold. And this of course comes from, you know, Kintsugi tradition of a teacup or a plate, like, you know, it's already broken. And, 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 and instead of hiding or throwing away the, the cup or uh, uh, plate that's broken, you, you know, tsugu, right? you, 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 you join it uh, with lacquer resin traditionally, and then you adorn it uh, with the with the gold, you enhance it, and uh, and it's a way of not forgetting uh, the history, including the breakage, including the uh, ruptures, uh, uh, to 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 honor the history of that teacup, and so to uh, in the creation of this new monument, which I'm hoping to uh, create uh, for the Japanese American National Museum here in Los Angeles uh, for an exhibit I'm curating on religion in the camps and. Uh, later this year in October, it's supposed to open. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to work with ceramicists. I'm working with light technology people to 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 display the names uh, in this uh, in the cube section on the bottom, the earth section, uh, so that we can have this kind of uh, new monument to remember those 125,000 people and uh, their their lives of disruption. And and so by so doing. Uh, I've been thinking about reparations and Tanahasi Coates' idea that it's not just about financial recompense, which is the gold, and you know, like, but but that, but that, true reparations is really about a reckoning with America, a reckoning with America's racial past. It's what I would call America's racial karma, and finding a way to not hide it, finding a way to join it, and finding a way to 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 adorn or highlight it. And I think names is one way to do it. So that's my project. I'm, I'm sorry, I hope I didn't, I, I may have overspoken, um, uh, but uh, let me end with that and, and, and uh, send it back to, to uh, uh, Professor Jackson. Great, thank you so much for that incredibly stimulating uh, talk, Duncan. Um, I have lots of questions. Sorry, sorry. Super, super grateful for everything you just uh, said, and um, 
Yeah, at this point, we're, we're happy to take uh, questions from folks. Uh, if you, it was already mentioned in the chat, but feel free to use the Q&A function in Zoom. It's at the bottom of the screen uh, between, at least on my screen, between the raise hand and live transcript buttons. And you can type in questions there and, um, and we'll, uh, we'll answer as many of those as we can in the next uh, 12 minutes or so before uh, this section of the, of the conference is over. While we wait for people to uh, to do that, though, I will get us started <laughs> um, since we have this since we have the, the honor of having you. Um, so thank you so much for this. I really appreciate both the the, the kind of um, and really what kind of came through, particularly when you're talking about the materiality of the of the um, of the the monument and these different uh, techniques that you're considering. Uh, is just kind of how um, how important uh, and, and how to be it is to be thoughtful about each kind of aspect of, of this. I mean, both. I mean, obviously, to be respectful towards the the memories of the people who were interned, but then also, um, but to do so in a way that that um, you know stays true to the experience, um, kind of culturally um, and if not spiritually, to folks as well. So I really appreciate that. I was wondering if if um, have you, uh, um, you know, in terms of, of your kind of uh, desire to work with different artists and so forth, have you found, um, have you found that experience, first of all? Um, and are there certain kind of either ideas that, that, that you've been really excited by, um, besides the ones that you've mentioned, or that just weren't feasible, for instance, for whatever reason, either financially or spatially or something, that if you could talk a little bit about about that as you've kind of you're narrowing in in the process and trying to home in on, on what would be most uh, most ideal. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, for example, uh, font, like I had not thought about that, but but uh, I've, I've been very uh, uh, thankful to be able to work uh, with, uh, I think there's, every year there's a list of 100 great kind of uh, font designer type of, uh, uh, you know, typography, you know, that area. And there's only one Asian American in there called a guy called Burton Hasebe. And, and he kindly offered to create a font for this monument, uh, as well as a glyph, you know, cause you need to need to have some breakage. Uh, so I haven't, we haven't released that yet, but it's going to be a kind of Gorinto kind of like, but in a much more kind of a little bit abstract way, it's like a five line thing that's going to, demarcate where one name ends or when next one begins it's and it's going to be done in red so it, it kind of looks a little bit like a sending buddy ish kind of like it's stitched, the names are stitched together but it's also a kind of like the five tier thing like each name has its own kind of like honoring um so just issues around spacing and font and like at that level i had not quite thought that i would need to work with an artist on that but I, I did, and it's it's been wonderful. Um, you know, I've also been talking to people like Victor Solomon, who is an artist here in LA. He does a lot of like uh, he works like LeBron James, and like uh, like he's in the kind of basketball sphere, and he does these kintsugi basketballs. And uh, he also did uh, during COVID times is uh, in South Central uh, Los Angeles. Uh, a lot of those courts have become little bit disused abandoned and so he would he would take these other things to make these kinski like basketball courts and stuff like that but um in that kind of idea of kind of repairing and and how to do you know i've been trying to work with artists who have a kind of very broad vision of of um uh, what is and the idea is like if we can do that for this community maybe some of these things like the cube and so forth like uh we might be able to do things, you know, uh, for de Leon, like at UCLA, like he's been doing this amazing project on called Hostile Terrains about uh, people crossing the border, you know, dying on the, in the Rio Grande, like the river and then, like, like naming as a, you know, I think since last year, Black Lives, like saying their names, like there's something very important about the names and if we can find a cross community way of doing these projects that uh, might be translatable, um, that's another thing. So I'm on the one hand trying to, as you were suggesting, like draw on Japanese, Buddha, like other things that are 
seem particularly apt uh, use of material, et cetera, for the World War II Japanese American case. But then there might be some technology and some other things that we developed that I think would be kind of interesting to work with, you know, uh, as I mentioned, the lynching memorial, the, 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 there are different groups out there that I think have also done some very important thinking about the value of uh, lifting up names and 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 uh, uh, I think that's part of reparation too is is cross community dialogue about that kind of thing. Yeah, no, thank you so much for that that um, that answer. And um, I just wanted to to mention that I think there's a, um, a mention in the chat uh, that this case I think uh, Suzanne Davis has put in um, a, a referencing Chiura Obata. Um, uh, and their work. So thank you so much, uh, Suzanne, uh, for, for sharing that with the, the attendees. Um, looks like there might be something. Oh, here we go. Now there are some questions in the chat. Thank you so much. So um, the first is, um, is from uh, Noriko Sugimori, uh, who says, uh, I understand the important role that Reverend uh, Nagatomi played, but I also assume that people with various denominations of Buddhism went to the internment camps. Uh, were there any problems among various Buddhist followers in the camp? Could you discuss any of those challenges in the camp? And this is Noriko and she's at uh, uh, Sugimori and she's at Kalamazoo College. Noriko, thank you for that question. You know, one of the most interesting things was I was studying uh, camp made a mimeographic kind of like a service books as they called them. Um, and what did they do when, uh, you know, the Catholics had their own space, the Protestants had their own space and the Buddhists had one space. So each camp of the large one, Dabari camps had uh, after a while, uh, even though initially there was some distrust of Buddhism, because rhetorically the four freedoms, you know, Roosevelt was freedom of religion was one of the key things that we, the United States was supposed to be fighting for against these fascists and Nazis, right? So um, they, they gave an equal space to the Buddhists, but then just like the Protestants, the Buddhists had this problem of like, if you have a Jodo Shinshu, Nichiren Shu, uh, like Shingon Shu, like, and, some people want to chant, you know, Namo Mirabutsu, Namo Henjo Kongo Daishi, or Namo Yoho Renge. Like each sect of Buddhism has a different way of practicing and chanting and so on. So what, in these service books, when they had these federated Buddhist barrack churches, as they were called, uh, they would sometimes come up with these techniques to, to get along by just saying Namo Butsu, like homage to the Buddha, instead of homage to Amida Buddha or homage to uh, Kobodaishi or, or to, 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 to Lotus Sutra. And so uh, those are some of the techniques. Uh, uh, it's not always that they, everyone got along, but uh, uh, they, they kind of, their circumstance made them have to kind of uh, uh, get along and not only between Buddhists, uh, but uh, going back to Reverend Nagatomi and the monument, he actually ultimately had a man named Ryozo Kado, he was famous in the LA area before the war, uh, having built some Japanese American Catholic uh, institutions. And so he's, he was not a Buddhist. Uh, so the architect was a Catholic. And then when they had the dedication ceremony for Obon of 1943, he invited a Protestant minister to come uh, to help with opening the monument because obviously there were some, even though Buddhists considered the majority of the Japanese American community at that time, there were Christians who also died that first winter into spring as well. And so he wanted to make it a kind of interfaith monument in that sense. And so even today uh, at the annual Manzanar pilgrimage, uh, every year in April, there's a pilgrimage. Uh, there's always at the heart of the gathering uh, interfaith ceremony to, 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 to re recall that past. Thank you so much. Um, so we have another question and maybe this will be our last question since we're coming up on, on 4 p.m. This is from Yuri Fukuzawa of the University of Michigan, uh, who uh, asks, has there been a similar effort from other such other religions such as, as Shinto? I'm assuming another a similar effort to memorialize um, uh, internees. Right. 
Um, I've not heard of a similar kind of effort, although uh, 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 Konkokyo, which is a you know Shinto kind of uh, 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 back in that that period, was classified as the Shinto organization by the War Relocation Authority. Um, they. Uh, Reverend uh, Tsuki, in honor of his father, he always goes to Mount Zanar as, as and participates in the interfaith uh, service. But Shinto had a very interesting place uh, uh, in, in in the camps. They were again hundred percent of Shinto priests um, were arrested and put into camps uh, run by the high security camps run by the Department of Justice. Uh, Eighty five percent of Buddhist priests were initially rounded up rather for, and put in those camps. Uh, and 12% uh, of cr Christian ministers were thus targeted. So there was clearly a ranking in the minds of American authorities at that time. Shinto is the most dangerous, Buddhists the second most dangerous, and Christians are at least more aligned or less dangerous. And so uh, in, in the... Um, World War II, I'm sorry, the main camps, the big camps, the one that had, that had over 10,000 people, the War Relocation Authority camps, they had this, what they called a leave clearance form in 1943, where they had to answer certain kind of questions and uh, that would rank your, they called it the loyalty questionnaire in short, uh, uh, it's a kind of colloquially. And there's certain questions, if you answered no in certain ways, question 27, 28, you were put in this segregation camp called Tudor Lake and whatever. But less well known is there's a question on there called question 16 on religion. And if you answered um, that question about religious affiliation as Shinto, you were automatically denied leave clearance. If you answered Buddhist, you got minus two points. If you answered Christian, you got plus one point. So uh, even in these camps, even though they allowed people to have certain kinds of spaces to practice their faith, Shinto was absolutely disallowed, and and um, and and there was this kind of gradation of uh, who was loyal and, and so forth. So, uh, it, it it's something that uh, uh, is a very complicated. I don't really have time to fully describe it, but uh, it, it 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 it's it's something that uh, 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 Shinto was a part of uh, certain camps like Tula Lake uh, because that's where all the people uh, went went into uh, who answered no and no um, on the questionnaire. Uh, and so there's uh, remaining uh, kamidana from Tula Lake, other, other kinds of things. That, again, people made out of found wood and that kind of thing. So I think uh, uh, all the traditions have different ways of handling that moment of loss and dislocation. And uh, uh, I guess my just bigger point is that uh, religion matters in these spaces as well. Great. Well, thank you so much for that incredibly detailed and learned answer and, and for the, the, the talk, the presentation more broadly. I mean, um, I, for one, am super excited to see um, kind of how this develops and it's, you know, it's such important work and I really appreciate um, really painstaking uh, work archivally, um, but then also I think uh, interpersonally that you're doing, you know, to kind of bring these things together. I think that that's certainly really needed. And I, moreover, um, the work that you're doing cross-culturally to think about kind of how discussions in black studies and kind of African-American African communities about reparations in relation to these kind of conversations in Japanese American context too, and thinking about how to draw these things together, you know, hopefully so that we we might all be liberated <laughs> in some way, shape or form spiritually, but also hopefully, you know, structurally as well is, is again, I would like to say really inspiring. So I appreciate that very much. Um, so we're at time now. Um, so I just want to um, thank all of you for, for joining. I also want to thank all of the staff and tech people, the II for all of your, your efforts to, to make this run as smoothly as possible. And uh, please join me in thanking um, Professor Duncan and Yukon Williams for this incredibly stimulating uh, uh, presentation. Thank you so much, Duncan.